So why don't we use that as a springboard to try to say, like, okay, well, what is the future going to bring, right? Because you mentioned that hopefully we'll soon have a full toolbox. There are a few different uh, uh, molecules that are coming down the pipeline. Could you maybe give us an overview of uh, some of those, those leading ones in the pipeline? And then we can have a conversation about how we think that's going to affect uh, the, the treatment of the patient and then the, the payer market behind it. Absolutely. So I guess we can start with Voxelator. Um, uh, Vox so Voxelator is, uh, as we discussed earlier, the, you know, the landmark sort of of these uh, recycle erythrocytes is the, that polymer forming, the polymerization of, of uh, sickle hemoglobin. And Voxelator is a, uh, being called a polymerization inhibitor. And, and the way that it does that is by stabilizing hemoglobin in the oxygenated state. Uh, of course, remembering that hemoglobin has to be deoxygenated for it to polymerize. Um, and uh, the phase three study um, was recently published in the New England Journal of Medicine. It was a multi-center phase three um, placebo-controlled randomized control trial. Um, it was a safety efficacy trial that looked at two dosing ranges, 1,500 milligrams and 900 milligrams. This is, a, this is an oral medication that's taken once daily. Um, with a primary endpoint, uh, which was quite innovative, that looked at uh, an increase in hemoglobin of one gram and how many per what percentage of the patient population enrolled achieved that. Um, the age range in this uh, study was 12 to 65 years old. And actually, the, 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 the results were quite promising. Um, they showed that out of uh, just under 300 patients that they enrolled, uh, of which uh, about two-thirds of them were on hydroxyurea, um, about half of them achieved a uh, response, a hemoglobin response at the high dose levels, um, which was a very statistically significant compared to the placebo group. Um, and they looked at how hemoglobin changed basically from initiation of study to week 24. Um, so sort of the delta of, of where, where, where the patients ended up. They also looked at um, markers of hemolysis to ensure that um, you know, there was an effect on uh, decrease in hemolysis in these patients. And, and they, were, they were able to show, um, as their secondary endpoints, they were able to show some reduction in um, things like uh, bilirubin and uh, markers of hemolysis. And based on the, the administration and the frequency, how do you think that would affect patient practice? You know, it's amazing to be able to have uh, a medication that will be once a day and oral. Um, you know, it's always, it's always tough, though, with medication that, uh, you know, adherence is always going to be an issue. And we have to start becoming innovative as providers um, on how we are going to sort of uh, push the button on adherence. It's, you know, really beyond uh, making the patient take the medication in your clinic. It's hard for us to stay on top of that. Um, but we just have to become innovative in our, in our methods. There. And where would you see using this in your for me, the idea of potentially having a medication that can increase hemoglobin by at least a gram in, in mo most of my patients and potentially reduce their risk of progression to multi-organ failure, a, a drug that promises sort of organ preservation and a decreased, potentially decreased risk of stroke for me, it, it's, it seems like a, a sort of a foregone conclusion that I'm going to want as many patients as possible on this medication.